Hello, can everyone hear me? I'm going to stand on my tippy toes so I don't mess with the speaker placement. Um, thank you for coming on this another beautiful Saturday afternoon. Uh, we have a great lecture today by Brian and Joyce Osberg, um, Relics of the Chicago Aurora and Elgin Railway. Thank you for coming. I am Michelle, the museum manager. Uh, we appreciate you coming down here. Our construction project is still ongoing at the museum. Um, we are open until four today, so if any of you, some of you mentioned, you might head over there to see the exhibit. Um, so there should be plenty of time after the event today. Um, so thank you again for coming. We do have a couple more events coming up next Wednesday, October 11th. We have When Trolleys Rode the Prairie Path. It is a dual projector, um, going a little bit more old school, with the slide projectors. Um, to present um, a bunch of different photos that exist. Um, a lot of the photos are categorized. If you look online, a lot of websites can tell you who took each photo and a lot of the photos you'll see repeat photos. Um, and then um, on October 26th, we have uh, at 7 p.m., we have Brian and Joyce back on the tragedies around the Chicago Aurora and Elgin, just in time for Halloween. <laughs> um, and so uh, I know they touched on it a little bit last time. They might briefly mention it again today, um, but that one will go a little more in depth than that one. And I'm really looking forward to that one. Um, probably more, we don't have any kids today, but probably more adult oriented. So bring your little kiddies to that one, probably. Um, and uh, and then we also have in November we have a presentation by our uh, uh, DuPage um, DuPage wow I am I'm only remembering their acronym right now DuPage Society of Model Engineers which is the engineers that built the train um, the model railroad in our basement at the museum they've been there for over 50 years. And so they will have a small presentation in the basement talking a little bit about the Chicago Aurora and Elgin that they have represented in the display, as well as the um, pioneer Zephyr that they also have in the display. And you can find out more about their history as well. So um, without anything further, we will let Brian and Joyce get started on relics of the Chicago Aurora and Elgin Railway. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. And uh, again, thanks to everyone for coming out on a beautiful day. Thank you. Um, can folks hear me? Yes. Good. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks to the DuPage County History Museum for inviting us to give this talk today, as well as the Wheaton Park District for providing this facility. It's uh, very much appreciated. My name is Brian Osberg. This is Joyce Osberg over here. Um, our interest in this topic uh, came about uh, some years ago. Uh, we started a YouTube channel uh, for regional history and prehistory. Maybe some of you have seen it, um, but we, we delve into topics like the CAE, the Chicago Great Western, the Winfield Mounds, the St. Charles Mounds, etc. We've done a whole series of, of, of videos related to those topics. Um, right now, we're pursuing a rather epic journey um, across northern Illinois and into Iowa following the the trail of the Chicago Great Western. Um, that seems to be a popular series, so a lot of people are enjoying that. This is a big topic today, believe it or not. Um, there's actually a lot of relics and artifacts remaining of the CAD, which we'll talk about why, but there's a lot left, and um, it's we view it as industrial archaeology, um, and there's still a lot to find. What we're going to present today is not comprehensive, in other words, um, we're going to talk a lot about many of the artifacts that we know of, but I'm sure there are some that in this audience people know about, some that we don't know about, and I'm sure that there are some yet to be found. Um, I think if uh, people do enough exploring, they will continue to find them, and uh, so if, if nothing else, we hope we encourage you to do that. 
So what is the C80? We covered it in depth a couple of about three or four weeks ago in our previous talk, and I think some of the other talks, what the C80 is. Um, it was the Chicago Warren Elgin <laughs> Railway. It was launched in 1902 uh, from Cleveland Syndicate. So we owe the Illinois Prairie Path to this Cleveland Syndicate, by the way. It was an electric interurban high speed that could travel speeds up to 70 miles an hour or possibly beyond. And they served the, the western part of Chicago and the western suburbs of Chicago all the way out to the Fox Valley with about 60 miles of trackage. The hub was right here in Wheaton. There were three major branches, one extending out to Elgin, one extending to Aurora, and one extending from Wheaton into uh, Chicago at 52nd Street initially and then at Wells Street uh, later on. There were four spurs over the lifetime of the uh, the railway, one going to Geneva off the Elgin, one going to Batavia off the Aurora, and two heading south from Bellwood, uh, one to Mount Carmel and one to Westchester. We'll focus on uh, the major branches and the two major spurs of Geneva and Batavia. It became the Chicago Aurora and Elgin Railway in 1922 after it had gone into bankruptcy in 1919 and was reorganized. Um, so that's how the, the, the subtle name change occurred from the Aurora Elgin in Chicago to the Chicago Aurora and uh, Elgin Railway. And when it did reorganize, it jettisoned the, uh, the Fox Valley trolley system. Uh, so those no longer were tied at the hip as they were prior to that uh, from earlier than 1922. So this railway persisted and faithfully served the Western suburbs until 1957 when passenger service was abruptly shut down. Uh, freight service continued, it limped along for another two years, 1959, that finally closed down. And then in 1961, the CAE abandoned the right of way. Um, there was no money, there was no money for cleanup. Uh, the only thing that was removed tended to be the things that could be recycled, like the rails and so on, so those were torn up. But everything else was pretty much left, left behind. And that's one of the reasons why we can find a lot today. I mean, if you go on the, Chicago, the Great Western Trail, for instance, you'll find far fewer artifacts than you will along the CA line. And that's because when the Chicago Great Western shut down, it was because it was a merger with the Chicago Northwestern. There was money to tear everything out and clean everything up. Um, whereas with the CA there wasn't any. It was just abandoned. And then I think all of you know the story that in 1963, Mayfield Guard Watts uh, proposed that this be that the, the former right of way be turned into a nature trail. Uh, the first, possibly the first rails to trails uh, uh, trail within the United States. And uh, we're living with that to this day. We get to enjoy the Illinois Prairie Path ever since. So <clears throat> let's go back to 1911. This is a 1911 circa map. This was pretty much when the Aurora Elgin in Chicago was in its heyday, arguably. Um, the only thing missing from this chart, I'll try to speak up if I can move you, back. You can take that, it should be. So, a few things to note from uh, this 1911 uh, picture. So, by this time, we've already, we already have the railway going all the way into Wall Street, into Chicago. We've got uh, the, uh, the Elgin line, of course. We've got the Geneva Spur uh, that was built in uh, the 1909 time frame. We've got the Batavia Spur, which was part of the original uh, 1902 build, as well as the Aurora line. We've also got the Mount Carmel Spur that was built in, I think, 1906. And then the Westchester Spur is the only thing missing that came down in about the same location that was built in 1926. But this, this particular map pretty much shows a fairly complete uh, picture, which is why we're going to refer to it again and again. And it also so shows the Fox Valley uh, trolley system that existed from Yorkville all the way to Carpenterville. So this was a really expensive electric and urban that also went out to DeKalb and also out to Belvedere. So it was a vast uh, interurban network that existed back then. So, like I said, today's discussion, we're going to focus on 
the Mangaline, the Elgin, the Aurora, and the two major spurs, the Geneva and the Batavia. So, relics of the CIA. As we mentioned, uh, with the bankruptcy in 1961 um, and the abandonment of the right of way, many things were left behind along what is today the Illinois Prayer Path and the Fox River Trail. We, uh, Joyce and I, have uh, done a methodical search along the Elgin Line, and really the only way to do that is by walking. Um, we've tried cycling it and looking, but you miss a lot of things when you're cycling, uh, so we would advise walking if you're really looking for these things. But we've logged over 80 artifacts along the Elgin Line alone, not including bridges and culverts in uh, former stations. So there's a lot to be found out there. And I'm sure we missed some things along the way as well. And there were certain things along the Fox River that they were just too numerous. We, we sort of lost the uh, count. Um, we won't be discussing equipage today. Um, so if, if you are interested in that, we're not going to be talking a lot about that. Uh, there is a lot of information relative to that, particularly if you go to the Fox River Trolley Museum in South Elgin, you go to the Illinois Railway, Railway Museum in uh, Union, they have many fine examples of uh, some of the older cars and newer cars that the A and C and the CA and they use. You can examine them up close, you can get on them, you can ride them. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have been, they allowed us to actually uh, drive the one of the St. Louis cars at uh, the uh, uh, Fox River Trolley Museum a few weeks ago, and that was that was quite a thrill, actually. So when we talk about relics, what are we talking about? And basically, we've got about seven categories that, that, that we've split these things into, and we're going to talk through as we go through and explore each of the major branches. So, of course, there's the station buildings, former station buildings that still exist, and they're either purpose-built or they're leased. So not all of the stations that the CA even used were purpose-built for the railway. Some of them were leased, as we'll see. Some of them are in situ. In other words, they're right where they were built, and some of them have been displaced. They're moved. Um, do I win a prize or what? Yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing is other buildings, auxiliary buildings that uh, still exist. So there's a few administrative buildings out there. There's some automated substations that still exist out there. Um, there are, of course, bridges and culverts from 1902 that still exist. There are underpasses and subways. And there's a myriad number of concrete bases that, that have different functions. Some were signal bases, some were light bases, some were um, the flagstaff bases where the flag stop uh, was, was uh, situated, and some were for railroad crossings. And you'll find them all along uh, the, all along all of the branches. Um, we were discussing with uh, the person sitting up to the front here that our experience has been that uh, the Elgin line has the most number of artifacts uh, of all the branches that exist. Why, we don't know, but uh, it is, seems to be where most of the artifacts were, were left remaining. Many of those concrete bases are in situ. Some of them are displaced. They've been bulldozed away from the, uh, their original position for various reasons. But they're, they're there. Many of them are hiding in the bushes. So you have to kind of look for them very carefully. There's a few examples of existing trackage still exists out there, sidings. Uh, we'll talk about those. And there's probably more than we know, by the way. And the fourth, the final category is topographical traces. That's the most uh, vague, but <laughs> I think you'll see what we're talking about here, where uh, as a result of the railway, you see altered roads, or you still see the shadow of the former trackway in, in the aerial views of the, the area for uh, electrical easements and so on, uh, utility poles mm -hmm. that still exist and still mark the, the path of the former railway. And if you look carefully, you'll see those either on the ground or actually uh, up close uh, on maps. So we'll first start, we'll go through each of the branches and talk through what's, to our knowledge, still there. And again, there might be things that you all know about and uh, we're, we're not uh, knowledgeable about. 
We'll start with the Elgin Branch, which was about 16 miles in length. It was the last uh, major branch to have opened in 1903, the spring of 1903, several months after the main branch and the Aurora branch opened up in 1902, late August of 1902. And again, our experience so far has been that the Elgin branch has the richest set of artifacts, as we'll see. So we'll talk about each of those categories that we mentioned a few moments ago. So you've got the four remaining stations from the Elgin line. You've got Prince Crossing in the upper left-hand corner. You also have Clintonville in the lower left corner. Um, the Clintonville station is in South Elgin. The Prince Crossing station is in West Chicago along Prince Crossing Road, conveniently. Uh, these were two of the original substations that were built to power this railway in 1902. And they not only powered the railway, but we often say this, they also powered local communities, industry, farmers. The, these buildings served a key transitional role from steam and manual power to electric power. So we think that these buildings are a vital part of the, the history of uh, DuPage County and Kane County. The Clintonville Station in Kane County is owned by the Kane County Forest Preserve and is occupied and leased by the Valley Model Railroad Association. It's in good stead. You can visit it uh, any Sunday. They'd be happy to uh, let you take a tour of it, so that's something we'd encourage you to do. The Prince Crossing Station is owned by Wheaton Academy. Um, it's fenced off. You really can't go in around it. Um, you can get some pictures from the street, but that's about the extent of it. Believe it or not, the Clintonville Station and the Prince Crossing Station looked identical in 1902. Uh, Prince Crossing has had two additions put on it, one to the west and one to the east. Uh, one was probably a passenger waiting area, this one here, and this other one was probably uh, put on for maintenance purposes. It probably in the 20s, uh, no doubt. There are also two displaced stations that you can find uh, from the former Elgin line. Uh, the upper right picture there is uh, the Wayne Station. Uh, that was uh, That's at the Fox River Trolley Museum. You can go see that today if you chose to. It's a 12 by 12 foot wooden frame structure with uh, gable ends and wide eaves. Nice little building. And down below it is the Hollywood or Renwick Station. It's an eight by eight foot wood frame structure. Um, it's also at the Fox River Trolley Museum. And that, that's much more exemplary of, of many of the, the former stations that used to exist, particularly in the, the, many of the rural stops uh, along the, for the CA80. They, they tended to be rather humble wood frame structures that you tended to see out in the countryside. So those, those were the stations. Now, what about auxiliary buildings for the Elgin Branch? Well, there's an excellent example of an auxiliary building at 77 Riverside Drive in downtown Elgin. It's uh, the, another substation, electric substation, built in 1908. And I can tell that because there's a big <laughs> sign on the front of the thing. <laughs> it's all of our deductive logic to figure that out. Uh, in any event, it's, it's still a fine... <clears throat> Looking building, it's in good stead. This was built, <coughs> excuse me, in 1908, particularly for the, uh, not so much for the ca &E, the power of the ca &E, because they already had six substations doing that, but it was more for the Elgin trolley and Elgin lighting. So this was another example where the ca &E was powering the communities of uh, that adjoined or, or, or adjacent to the railway. So, so that's what this substation was all about. It served potentially as a backup to Clintonville. If Clintonville ever had a problem, went down. But uh, to our knowledge, that, that didn't happen. So that's another uh, example of a, of a building, an auxiliary building that exists along the Elgin, Elgin line. Then regarding bridges, well, there's quite a few uh, former bridges and underpasses associated with the Elgin line. This this is many of them or most of them. We're not going to talk about all of them, uh, but these are the many photographs that we've taken, except for that one. It's really photographed. 
uh, that we've taken of the various bridges and culverts um, along the, uh, the Elgin line. Now, what's the difference between a bridge and a culvert? Culvert is a small bridge. Um, it's, I don't know if there's a, a, a definite technical difference between the two, but a culvert tends to be something on the order of a six or eight foot span um, that's you know, carrying water underneath it, something more akin to this or that. Um, whereas a bridge is something more akin to that, and of course that right there. So let's talk about a few of these. <clears throat> so in the upper left, I think many people are familiar with, with that bridge. It's today called Volunteer Bridge. Uh, it's in Wheaton. It was at the very start of the Elgin Branch. It's a steel truss bridge built in the 1907 time frame. We've never been able to pin down an exact date for it, but it was built in that time frame. And it, re it replaced a wooden bridge. Uh, we do have pictures of the original wooden bridge that not only spanned the North Chicago and Northwestern line, which is what this line is here. So it, it carried the CA&E over the Chicago and Northwestern line. The second bridge is the Wesley Street Bridge right here. So it's actually two bridges. And uh, the Volunteer Bridge it carried it over the Chicago and Northwestern. The, this high bridge, as it was originally called, uh, was repaired and restored and rededicated in 1984 after the abandonment of the railway and the dozens of volunteers that worked to restore the path um, that ended somewhere back over here into downtown Wheaton. So this bridge required a lot of work before it could be, people could walk on it or ride their bikes on it and so on. And it was a small army of volunteers that did that. And uh, so the bridge was rededicated in 1984 in their honor and renamed the Volunteer Bridge as a result. And that happened in the, uh, the volunteers from the 70s and 80s. The, the bridge over here, the next major bridge you encounter heading to the northwest, uh, the Elgin Line, is the Winfield Creek Bridge. Now, hundreds of people walk and run and ride over that bridge every day. And, I think most people don't realize what a substantial bridge it is. It's a concrete arch bridge. You can see some decay there. Um, but in any case, it's got about a 25 foot span. And um, it's a substantial bridge that still exists back from the, the very earliest days of the, the CA and E. And it carries, uh, it carried the trains over the Winfield Creek. These two lower photographs are interesting. So this one is the next bridge you encounter as you go through Lincoln Marsh heading northwest along the Elgin Line. Most people don't see it as a bridge though. If a few hundred, several hundred feet south of Jewel Avenue, if, if you know where that is, um, as you go through the cutting, there's a cutting through Lincoln Marsh as well as a ridge, right? If you look to your left and your right, you'll see two sets of concrete piers, actually two sets of uh, three, one, two, three. So there's, on both sides you'll see these three foot by two foot concrete piers, very substantial piers. There's one set up here, and there's one set down below at uh, grade level. So the next time you're out there, take a look and you'll see them. People pass by these all the time and, and don't pay any attention to them. But we call it a, a mystery bridge because we can find no maps or aerial photographs that show this bridge ever having been there. But there is clearly the footings for a bridge have been put in there. Uh, the only thing we can find is a 1920 map that refers to the, the road to the east of the bridge as Bridge Street. There's a quote. Um, right now it's called Prairie Avenue, but 100 years ago it was called Bridge Street for some reason. Again, we have no evidence that this bridge ever stood or was ever built. So our working theory, and you know, we, we'd love if, if somebody could uh, do research on this and find out more about it. But our working theory is that, that this bridge was put in place for the construction of the railway. And why do we say that? Well, because Lincoln Marsh required a huge amount of fill. I mean, that ridge that goes through Lincoln Marsh, if you've ever walked it, is, it is 20 feet high by 40 foot base. That required a huge amount of infill to fill that marshy area to create that ridge that we all enjoy today walking through. Um, 
And what might make sense is if they built a bridge, not at Jewel Road, but at a place where they could, uh, with this bridge, they could dump material down into waiting wagons or, or cars below, which would just carry it down into the, uh, the marsh area. So that's our working theory as to what this bridge was for. It was built temporarily out of wood. Once the, the, the railway was constructed, completed, they took it down probably. But, but you know, we're, we're certainly willing to be corrected on that, but that's, that's a, an interesting part of the uh, artifact that you'll find right along uh, Lincoln Marsh. Similarly, you'll find very similar piers uh, north of Clintonville between Raymond Street and the Clintonville Station. You see these enormous concrete piers that have toppled out of the hillside. Um, looks something like a ruined temple uh, along there. Many of those concrete piers are buried in the bush, so you don't you have to carefully find them. But we know that that bridge was built, and it was built as a wooden bridge that spanned into the quarry that existed to the east of uh, the, the, the trackway. There were, there was a very large quarry to the east of the trackway uh, right there. I've forgotten the name of it. But that was a bridge that used to exist, that used to go into there. So you can still see those artifacts today. Uh, as you walk along the, the path from Clintonville to, to uh, Raymond Street, <clears throat> where the Hollywood Renwick station used to, to, used to exist. Then, um, between County Farm Road and the Prince Crossing Road, along the Elgin Line, you find probably the oldest, or the largest surviving concrete bridge from the CAED. Um, this was a uh, a double arched design made out of concrete with a span of roughly 100 feet. You don't get a good look at this bridge, just like the Winfield Creek Bridge, unless you get off the bridge and go down by the river and you see what a substantial structure this is. But uh, to our knowledge, this is the, the, the largest surviving bridge that was built by the CAE back in the early part of the 20th century. Another fine example of a bridge built then is this the Poplar Creek Bridge which is a bit to the north uh, of the Clintonville Station. And the Poplar Creek Bridge is, is again, has about a 60-foot span, a single concrete arch, still in very good condition and still something you can get close to. This is uh, right off of Raymond Street in South Belgium. So you can still see that today. And just a little bit further north of that, of course, is the underpass that the CAE used to go under. This was the Milwaukee St. Paul line that ran over it and uh, became the Chicago and Northwestern. But that this railway line has now been deprecated. It no longer uh, is used. So the, the bridge still exists and the CAED used to run under the subway or underpass. So those are, are some examples of many bridges and culverts you'll see uh, along the Elgin Branch. And then there are many culverts, uh, you know, eight foot span concrete uh, bridges that, that we haven't even talked about. Concrete bases. So I think we've got two pages at least of concrete bases. We're not going to go through all of them. But um, there's a lot of concrete bases along the Elgin Branch. And again, you have to watch out for these. Um, some of them are very evident and some are hidden away in the bushes. So you see many examples of signal bases. They tend to be these large uh, three foot by two foot. And they stand proud out of the ground, maybe one or two feet out of the ground. You'll also see light bases, something more like that. Um, and you'll also see uh, crossing signal bases, more like that. So this particular one, Oh, this is uh, the one by Lincoln, in Lincoln Marsh. Yeah, so this is the, the, the one in Lincoln Marsh. And then this particular one is by Clintonville, and it was for the crossing signals. There used to be crossing signals in the middle of the road. I think it was Kenyon Road. And it got bulldozed and pushed into the bushes. And uh, so this, this still exists. You can still see the what would have been the two posts coming out of the, the ground here. And this particular... Uh, concrete base is for a flagpole. So if you go by the Lincoln Avenue station, 
which is the, at the, the first station after Wesley Street, Lincoln Avenue, look in the ground, you'll see the square concrete base is where passengers used to come up and pull the chain and set the flag to let the motor man or conductor know that uh, there was somebody waiting to be picked up. Here's even more examples. And the signal bases you can see in particular because they typically have this uh, large opening with a fake light interior. It's an old type of plastic, uh, insulated plastic basically, that uh, used to protect the wires that went through these concrete blocks. But you, you see these particularly in the signal bases. And then you know that that's a, uh, that is most likely a signal base. Some of them are in very fine condition, like this one here. Some of them are uh, seriously uh, deteriorated. And then you've got uh, another class of concrete base. You'll see all along the Fox River, along by the Elton Branch, these triangular concrete bases. And there's probably a dozen of them or more. Um, we believe that they were for lighting, uh, lighting the trackway. Uh, back when the, the, the railway was in operation. Now, somebody might correct us on that, that's fine, but uh, they, if you walk along the Fox River Trail, uh, which was the former Elgin Line, you will see many of these uh, that have, they're still standing by the waterside. Many have eroded out of the banks, so they're lying on their side, and so on. But uh, we believe that it's another set of artifacts related to the ca &E. Now, topographical traces. Um, the primary one that is on the Elgin line is by the Prince Crossing Station. So here we have Prince Crossing Road. Here we have the Illinois Prairie Path, which used to be the ca and &E line. And here we have the Great Western Trail. Um, back in the early 2000s, this piece of real estate was sold for reasons we're still not entirely sure about, uh, to Wheaton Academy, which exists over here. So they bought the station as well as the, the right of way, although I believe that the, this, this piece of property is still owned by the DuPage County Forest Preserve, or DuPage County, I should say. But in any event, you can still see, even though it's no longer accessible, this chunk of the former right of way, you can still see by the, the utility poles as well as the the footprint in the ground, that uh, this is clearly where the old trackway went, and you can still follow it, both on maps as well as visually on the ground. If you go down and walk over here, or you go over here, you can see clearly where the old right of way went. This was the crossing in Prince Crossing. This is where the Chicago Great Western traversed over the Chicago, Aurora, and Elgin, which went under a bridge. It's been infilled now. But this is the crossing in Prince Crossing, in case you're wondering. So now we're going to talk about <laughs> Geneva Spur. Okay. Joyce will leave us in that. So the Geneva Spur was built in 1909 and closed down in 1937. It's approximately nine miles long and it wise off of the Elgin Branch, a little bit west of Pleasant Hill Road in Winfield, Illinois. And it was a single track its entire way. Um, the Geneva Spur closed down when the railway was still in operation. So there was plenty of money to do a thorough cleanup of the, the Geneva Spur. And they pretty much did. But fortunately, there are still some artifacts that remain of, along the Geneva line. So the only station that remains on the Geneva Spur is the Geneva Terminal. And that remains because it was one of the stations that the AE and C leased. So it went into a pre-existing building. And it was located on the west side of the Fox River at 307 West State Street. The Noble House restaurant today occupies the spot that the Geneva Terminal was in. Um, passengers would buy their tickets and could wait inside the terminal. 
And when they came out, they would street board the trolley here. And that trolley could then either head west and join up with the Fox River trolley system, or it could head east along the Geneva Spur and then merge into the Elgin line. The lower right picture here shows the stairs that remain from the High Lake Station. This was near High Lake Avenue in West Chicago. Um, the tracks ran along the lower part of the stairs and the High Lake Station was up above. That station was built in 1909 when the Geneva Spur was built. And the other stations built at that same time were in Berkeley, Elmhurst, and Chicago Golf. All of those were brick stations that had a very similar build. But all that remains now of High Lake is, are those stairs. But they're, they're pretty impressive when you walk along the track there. There are still a few bridges and culverts along the Geneva Spur. The largest is the bridge that once spanned the west branch of the DuPage River. That bridge had a span of about 80 feet, and there are four piers and two abutments. They're all still there, although they're not all standing vertically at this point. Um, this is located in the Winfield Mounds Forest Preserve. The upper right photograph is of a small bridge or culvert that's about a 10 foot span. And that's located between the Winfield Mounds Forest Preserve and the High Lake Station. The bottom photograph is of a very nice um, culvert. This is where the right of way is approaching the Fox River in Geneva, and it's between Bennett and Dodson Streets. We found just a few signal bases along the Geneva Spur. The top three photographs are examples of those, and those all we found between the Woodfield Mounds Forest Preserve and the High Lake Station. You see a theme here, there's a lot still in that area, which is also where these lower two photographs are. They're intriguing cement structures. We don't know exactly what they were for, but they appear to be related to the railroad. And they're about 1,800 feet west of the Winfield Mounds Trail and on the south side of the right of way. So if anyone happens to know what was there, we'd be more than happy to find out. <laughs> there are a few topographical traces still remaining along the Geneva Spur. This one is near where the Geneva Spur wide off of the Elgin branch. This is the Elgin branch running from the lower right to the upper left. This is County Farm Road here, just to place yourself. And right in this area is where the Geneva Spur wide off. So you can see it's very heavily built up with um, homes, but this area has still remained clear. And we could probably thank ComEd for that because they still own the easement through there. Now, another topographical spur for the Geneva line occurs more at near the Geneva end of the line. Um, again, here is the, the IPP coming in from the east. This is East Side Street. This, you can see very clearly here where the right of way continued on towards the Fox River. The CIE would turn down Bennett Street and then turn again to cross over the Fox River at State Street. When the Illinois Prairie Path was built back in the late 60s, early 70s, the residents who lived along this area at that time refused to give comment permission to put in a nature trail along there. So that's why the Illinois Prairie Path turns right and heads north at that location. So this is still comment easement today. It's still open. This area has a very nice footpath through it. But unfortunately, the Illinois Prairie Path does not go through there. Now, I can't say that, you know, if any of the people that live there now were the ones that refused to let the Illinois Prairie Path through. But it's unfortunate. It'd be nice to be able to just continue straight on through that area. So the next line that we'll be looking at is the Aurora Branch. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. So, the Aurora Bridge. Uh, this is one of the parts of the original 1902 bill. This was about a little over 14 miles in length and went from Wheaton into downtown Aurora. And uh, <clears throat> surprisingly, even though it's one of the larger branches, uh, there's relatively a, a modest number of uh, artifacts along the Aurora branch. Um, we haven't thoroughly explored it yet. By that I mean a methodical walk and recording every artifact that we find. But um, generally speaking, it seems to be more sparse than uh, the Elder Branch. So the only station left on the Aurora Branch is the Terminal Traction Building. Uh, with the Traction Terminal Building, which is uh, In any case, that's on the northwest corner of uh, Broadway and Galena Boulevard. It's this beautiful building, six-story building. And this was the headquarters for the CANE, as well as a the terminal building, the terminal stop for the CANE from 1915 to about 1935. And the reason why it became that in 1915, the headquarters, and they occupied the top story, the headquarters of this building, uh, was because the original headquarters in Wheaton uh, which was Hotel Wheaton, um, right across from the, the train station in downtown Wheaton. That got hit by lightning in a freak storm in March of 1913. The building burned down rapidly. Um, there was some uh, disagreement between the CIAE and the Wheaton response to putting out the fire, apparently. They weren't too happy about it. In any event, they pulled up stakes and moved to Aurora. Uh, two years later, and they moved into this building, which was originally Hotel Arthur, built in 1905. Very nice building, one of the nicest buildings in Aurora at the time, and uh, the tallest building in Aurora at that time. So the, the ANC had money, um, make no mistake, the ANC had money at this time that they could afford to lease one of the nicer buildings in Aurora. This, uh, just like the Geneva Station, this was street boarding, uh, there would be a ticket station, a ticket agent, as well as a, a dining area, a waiting area on the first floor. People would come out to the streets to board the train and then head down Broadway, uh, head north along Broadway. So this is the only remaining, uh, the only remaining station from the, uh, along the Aurora line. And the traction terminal building, well, why is it called traction? Uh, as David well knows, uh, this is the traction was a term for trolley systems back at the 1900 time frame. There we go. There's only a handful of bridges that still exist. There were more. Um, for instance, there was a bridge by Warrenville going over the, uh, the west branch of the DuPage River that has been since replaced. But there used to be more bridges uh, along the Aurora line, but um, most of them have been replaced. But there's still a few that exist between Eola and Farnsworth Road in particular. This is one example. Um, it's another culvert, perhaps with about an eight-foot span. I often think, the, think these look like dolmens uh, from you know, the UK. I often wonder if the dolmens in the UK were the sign of a former railway that used to exist in the Stone Age time. Um, the other major bridge that exists just 500 feet to the west of Farnsworth Avenue is this uh, large concrete bridge with a double arch. I think that's about a 40 foot span. <clears throat> and I think that's, this is the remnants of Indian Creek actually that's coming through here. So there's a few examples of bridges that still exist along the Aurora line. And then there's quite a few uh, signal bases, concrete bases, Again, not as many as we've found along the Elgin, but there's still quite a number. And just going from, heading from Wheaton outwards, this one here is, um, if you've ever walked between Roosevelt Road and Arbor Street, downtown Wheaton, along the Aurora Branch, uh, to, this, to the east side of the path, closer to Arbor Street, you'll find this very nice signal base sitting there. It's back in the bushes. Well, not a lot of people see it, but it's there. When you go down to Chicago Gulf, you'll see this large concrete chunk uh, embedded in the, the, uh, the ground. 
We're not sure exactly what it is. It could be a signal base that's been upended. It could be part of the original uh, station that used to exist, which was a mostly a brick building that also had a fair amount of concrete in the, the, the base part of it. So it's possible that it's part of the, the former station that just got pushed with a bulldozer off to the side and, and covered by dirt. Uh, but it, it, you'll definitely see that if you go by the uh, Chicago Golf Station. A little further down the, the, the way, when you get to the Plamondon Station, Plamondon was a few thousand feet north of Orchard Street. If any of this is resonating at all with any of you. But as we'll see, uh, this was probably an example of a base for uh, crossing signals. And we'll find out why that might have been there uh, when we talk about topographical traces. Then when you head a little bit further uh, southwest, you come upon these artifacts here. And you'll notice that these are signal bases that are displaced. They're not in their original position. They've been moved from their original position. And they're all fairly close together. And they're just east of St. James uh, Farm. Yeah. St. James Farm. A working theory is, is that they used to be on the old McCormick property and got bulldozed off. Uh, there was a station on that uh, property that was purchased by the McCormicks around 1920 called Gary Road. Um, we have no evidence that that station stayed in existence after the McCormicks purchased it. We could be proven wrong about that, but we have seen no evidence that it still existed after the McCormicks purchased it. In any case, you find these large signal bases that are have obviously been moved with heavy machinery, pushed into the right of way into the bushes. Um, so there's a reasonable probability they originally were on the old McCormick property. As you move uh, southwest, I mean, there's other excellent examples. One right there, one right here, a signal base between, this is between Weisbrook and, and Plamondon. Um, and then a few more as you head uh, further southwest. So again, you can see these as you're walking along the Illinois Prairie Path and you keep a, a uh, careful watch for them. Now there's two or three excellent topographical traces of the Aurora Branch. Uh, the first is along the Fox, close to the Fox River. And this is where the, the original line came along the Fox River here. Illinois Avenue would be about right here if uh, you're familiar with that area. Illinois Avenue would have been there. The CAD would have come right up along here and gone and then connected up with what is today the Fox River Trail. But today, if you take that bike path, you are rerouted off in this direction. Yeah, right here. And you have to go up to Aurora Avenue and cross over and then reconnect to the Illinois Prairie Path. So, all of this property and this property was sold um, at some point. So you've got light industry on both sides of Aurora Avenue here. But if you're standing along here, you can see the, the utility poles clearly marking the way of the former railway going uh, behind all of this light industry, crossing Aurora Avenue uh, 25 at an oblique angle, and then continuing on across this, what is now a parking lot, that's Hanks Avenue, and then continuing on with the Prairie Path today. By the way, the Hanks Avenue substation was right about here. So remember those six original substations I talked about earlier? One of those was right in this open spot, which has uh, been absolutely cleared of artifacts. A second very good topographical trace along the Aurora Branch is, uh, so here you've got Winfield Road. Here you've got St. James Farm. Here's the Elmer Ferry Path coming right here. And here's Butterfield Road, just to orient everybody. So the Ferry Path comes along and makes a sharp turn today, goes along St. James Farm, and then you go under a bridge and come along Butterfield Road, cross over. Uh, but uh, Winfield Road, and then you pick up again right along here. Now, the original line, as you can plainly see from this aerial photograph, 
is is it went, went right through with the southwest southeast corner of uh, St. James, and then cut off this corner here um, as part of the uh, the original trackway, and it actually went under two bridges here. Um, there was a, a bridge that the CAE went under a, a road bridge that carried Butterfield Road over it. And just right over here, there was another bridge for Hoy Road. Hoy, the Hoy family lived uh, somewhere right over here where Blackwell is. But the Hoy Road, uh, which sort of branched off here, went up along in this direction. There was another bridge right here. And curiously, that bridge has been that where the train went under that bridge, an underpass, a subway. It's been infilled today. Uh, and now it's a lake. So that low area where the underpass went is now a small pond or lake. But if you go into St. James Farm, you will clearly see the row, the line of utility poles that, that show and mark the former location of the uh, CAD going through St. James Farm. And the original Gary Road was probably in this area here, Gary Road Station. And those artifacts I talked about were just right here. So if you just go in that location right before the prairie path heads south, go in the bushes and you'll see several signal bases lying on their side, mysteriously. A third topographical trace, and probably my favorite, is um, in Wheaton, South Wheaton. So here is Weisbrook Road, here is Plamondon Road, and here's the former CAD trackway, which is today the Illinois Prairie Path, right along here. And here's Orchard Road. Warrenville Road. Have you ever wondered if you've ever gone through this area? You've got this mishmash of roads trying to head north. Um, you're making all these extreme oblique turns, thinking, what, what's going on here? Um, am I in the right place? Well, Warrenville Road, if you look at this map carefully, this was the original Warrenville, Warrenville Road that came straight through here before the railway came through. See that? Very clear. And that was Warrenville Road. It was a straight beeline from Wheaton to Warrenville. They knew what they were doing when they built roads back then. Um, they didn't build it this way. They didn't build Warrenville Road coming like this. That wasn't the invention of the, the people that originally made that. They, they built a straight road going to Warrenville, heading southwest. When the railway came along, it was a very oblique angle, as you can see, to the original road. Very oblique. And one thing about those oblique interchanges or uh, crossings were they were very dangerous. They tended to be very dangerous. I mean, looking over your shoulder to see if a train's coming, uh, they tend to be a place of, of lots of accidents. I don't know if that's why they decided to change it. And I don't know the exact time frame that they changed it. Um, but it was in the early part of the 20th century, probably in the, first, in the 19, 1900 to 1910 time frame. But you can clearly see where they rerouted Warrenville Road, south to Orchard Road, back up to Warrenville Road and heading south again. So whenever you pass through that area, and I've done this hundreds of times, and you're thinking, what's going on with this road? Um, you can thank the CAE for that because that's that's a direct result of the CAE going through that neighborhood. So that's one of my favorites because you, we still live with that today, even though the railroad's been going for 60, 70 years. So now we'll talk about the Batavia Spur, which came off the Aurora line. Mm -hmm. The Batavia Spur was part of the original 1902 construction of the AEMC, and it remained open until the railroad was abandoned in the late 50s, early 60s. It wide off of the Aurora branch at Eola Junction or Batavia Junction, as it was also known. It was about six miles in length, and it was single-tracked along its entire length. Like the Geneva Spur, there's only one station that remains of, on the Batavia Spur. 
and again, like Geneva Station, it is a was a pre-built building that the A, E, and C lease space in. Um, this building is on the southeast corner of where Wilson Street crosses over the Fox River. The building that it went into is the Tomley Building. This was built in 1878 by Norwegian emigrants Ole and Brigetta Tomley. It was for their furniture and casket making business, and it was also their home. Um, passengers for the AEMC or CAME would purchase their tickets inside in a first floor ticket office, and there was also a waiting area there. They would then exit out the rear of the building to board the, again, a trolley car, because there were overhead wires through this space, and they would take that car south towards the Aurora branch. Oh, I should say that building still exists today, and it's in good condition because the city of Batavia purchased it several decades ago, and they use it as a small business hub now. These are examples of um, bridges, underpasses, and culverts along the Batavia Spur. This top left photograph there is um, the underpass going under the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad. That's just a short distance south of where the Batavia Powerhouse was. If anyone knows where the Funway Amusement Center is now, that building stands where the Batavia Powerhouse was. And I had forgotten to mention that on the Batavia Spur, there really wasn't a lot of passenger service, but this line remained open the entire time the railroad was open because the railroad needed access to the Batavia Power Plant. That is what provided all of the electricity for the railway. The upper right photograph here is of a small culvert or bridge. It has maybe a six to eight foot span, and that's located between the CB and Q underpass and Hart Road. This lower picture is of an original bridge built in 1902 um, that's located just west of the Illinois Route 25 overpass. This right picture is an interesting one. It's a new bridge built by the Illinois Prairie Path, and it's supported by original 1902 abutments, and that is over Indian Creek um, between Kirk Road and State Street or Butterfield Road. We've only found a, a handful of artifacts along the Batavia route, but in all honesty, it's another one of the lines we haven't done a meticulous search for. We have not walked every foot of this, this spur yet. Um, this left photograph is of a heavily leaning signal base that's located southeast of the Indian Creek Bridge and um, between Kirk Road and Butterfield Road. The right photograph is of a bracket arm that was used to support the trolley, overhead trolley wires. That was located um, near the Batavia VFW property it's south of where the Batavia Terminal is and north of where the power plant was. Now, unfortunately, Brian and I were just there a few days ago, and the pole is still there, but the arm bracket is no longer on that, that pole. At least we didn't find it. <laughs> there are a few topographical traces still left on the Batavia Spur. Here is the Funway Amusement Center, and that's again where the Batavia Powerhouse was. You can see, this is the Fox River Trail, but you see the right-of-way coming up and heading north. This is the outer back parking lot for the Funway Amusement Center. Um, you can see where the right-of-way went straight north through there. And actually, if you're on, at that location, you can see straight through and see where the trail picks up again to the north there. The official Fox River Trail, though, curves around closer to the Fox River. Just south of that location here is a Glenwood Park Forest Preserve. The AEC built Glenwood Park near the Batavia Power Plant, and they built it and then advertised it largely to people in Chicago, city dwellers, 
to come out and spend the day in the country and get away from the hustle bustle noise of, of the city. And this also was a way to encourage ridership on their trains on the weekends when people weren't commuting and using their trains. Another topographical trace on the Batavia Spur occurs where the Batavia line joined with the Elgin line. This is a little south of the Bilter Road station. Here you can see the Batavia Spur coming south towards I-88. Now it makes a sharp 90-degree um, turn and goes up and around the entrance and exit ramps from I-88. This is the Aurora branch down here. You can still see clearly where the right-of-way curved down through this area and joined up with the Aurora branch. At, that was Eola Junction or Batavia Junction. That's a pretty industrial area, but you know the right of way is still very clear to see there. So the next line we'll be looking at is the last one for today, and that's the main line. So main line, the main event, if you will. Um, we're going to focus on. Uh, the area from Wheaton to Win uh, Maywood Forest Park. Primarily that's because what, that's where the prairie path is today. It's more accessible. And uh, uh, Forest Park was the place where the CA terminated from 1953 to 1957, Fairbanks. This was, a, I think, 18 miles in length when it went all the way into Chicago originally. Now, there are some excellent examples of former stations along the main branch, and the chief and probably the, the, the nicest looking one is the Villa Avenue station, which still exists along Villa Avenue conveniently. This is built in 1929 with a Tudor Tudor revival uh, style. This replaced an earlier brick station that was built in 1910. So Villa, the Villa Park station, believe it or not, had a nice station there before, built in 1910, and it looked just like the Chicago Gulf, High Lake Station, the Berkeley Station, a few of the Elmhurst stations. It looked very similar to that. As Joyce said, they had a standard blueprint for many of the stations they built in the 1910 time frame. And that, that the original station for Villa Park used to stand right across the street. It was a wood structure, um, and it was called Secker, Secker Road uh, before it was Villa Avenue. So this is a, uh, probably the best example of a purpose-built station for the CAED that still exists today. And it was uh, purchased by the Village of Villa Park in the 1970s. Um, it currently houses the Villa Park History Museum. So you can visit this and go in and take a look around if you so desire. But it's very well kept. Another fine example of a in C2 original station from the CAE is at Ardmore, uh, just a little bit to the west of Ardmore Avenue. And this building was built in the 19, 1910 time frame. And this is an example of a station that was built by developers trying to lure people from Chicago to come buy property out uh, in the area. Ardmore was a subdivision at that time, it wasn't part of Bill Park. And so the developers, uh, Ballard and Pottinger, they developed many subdivisions in the western suburbs. They uh, funded the building of this very nice uh, building, which was designed in a prairie style by architect John Van Bergen, who just happened to be a nephew of uh, Ballard. That's convenient. Um, this building also was purchased by the village of Villa Park in the 70s and now houses the Villa Park Chamber of Commerce. Um, I don't think you can go in there, but you certainly can go and take a very close look at the building and it's still in very, very fine shape. There's a few other remnants of stations that exist um, along the main line. So for instance, this is the, at the site of the Glen Oak Station. So just to the east of Hill Avenue in Glen Ellen. Um, if you looked to the south uh, after Going over Hill Avenue, you'll see two large stone gates. Those are the gates that people used to go into and out of the country club, the Glen Oak Country Club. 
um, going to the train station, which was right along the uh, Illinois Prairie Path today. And about 50 feet to the east of these gates, you'll still see the foundation of the train station still there. Um, it's under debris, very, you know, leaves and so on, but you'll find it as the corner of the foundation right there. It was about a 10 by 20 foot wood frame building. But uh, you'll still see the raised platform right along there. There's also one too, we didn't put it in the slides, but we just saw it the other day by College Avenue, if you go by College Avenue, you'll actually see the, uh, the wood timbers that held up the platform um, and the raised platform for a small wooden frame building that existed right there at College Avenue as well. So at two or three of these sites uh, along the main line, they'll find uh, remnants or residue of uh, the earlier stations. Now, in terms of auxiliary buildings, the main line has the most. Um, the, the most prominent of these is the CAE Administrative Building built in 1949. Remember, they left Wheaton in, in a huff in 1915, and they came back to Wheaton uh, in the 1940s, and they built this 19, very nice uh, one-story red brick building, still there. Um, I think it's uh, uh, some small firm that owns it right now. But in any event, if you look at uh, these, these concrete porticos on the north side of the building, if you look up top here, you can still see the anchor bolts where the, the Chicago Aurora and Elgin signage used to be. So if you get your thrills by looking at those sorts of things, it's still there. Um, also, there's three fine examples of automated substations uh, along the main line. This is the Mannheim substation. It's just this corner of the building it has been added to. But this corner of the building right here, it's at the uh, southeast southeast corner of where Mannheim Road meets the Illinois Park. You'll see this automated substation that was built in 1925. You'll also see two other automated substations a little further west. So this one's at by Ballette and Sherry and Elmhurst. This is the Elmhurst substation conveniently. Um, a very nice building with tile work around the doors and fancy windows and a tower, little tower structure that exists. It was built to meld in with the, the residential neighborhood. This was built in 1927. This too, almost the exact design, was, was a substation built on Lombard off of Highland Avenue. Um, also built in 1927. They probably used the same blueprints, but it features the same tile work on the doors and very similar windows and so on. Um, so, three examples of automated substations that still exist along the main line. And then this building here is a few buildings along Carlton in downtown Wheaton that uh, we don't know for certain, but they appear to be uh, associated with the railway, probably as freight buildings. Um, and the reason why we're fairly sure that this is associated with the railway is because if you look at the uh, old aerial photographs and so on, as we'll soon see, uh, this building honors the, the former trackway and the sidings that used to go off. So it, it's not aligned with Carlton, the street that it's on. It's aligned with the former railway, uh, the ca &E railway, the sidings. So it probably was a freight building of some sort. In terms of bridges, uh, there's a handful. Again, many of the larger bridges have been removed uh, from uh, the main branch, but there are still some excellent examples. You've got this large underpass or subway at the Indiana Harbor Belt, uh, for the Indi Indiana Harbor Belt, which passed overhead. And this is by 25th Avenue in Bellwood. Huge concrete structure. So the, the CA&E went under the Indiana Harbor Belt, and the Chicago Great Western went right through here. So it had parallel tracks right next to the ca &E. This was built around 1931-32 and it replaced a, a large wooden uh, structure that existed that burned down. Uh, but this was, uh, uh, still is, kind of a marvelous concrete structure that still exists in Bellwood. A little further west in Hillside, um, you'll see this bridge that was built in 1937, the uh, Wolf Road by Wolf Road. Wolf Road used to be a grade level crossing, but there were a lot of accidents between the, the railway and the Wolf Road. 
uh, automobiles and trucks that passed along Wolf Road. And so in 1937, they built a bridge over Wolf Road that carried the CNA train overhead. And uh, you'll see these Art Deco pilasters on each of the four corners of this uh, bridge. And the, the Art Deco betrays the time period it was built in 1937. In Glen Ellen, the underpass uh, by Hill Avenue, Hill Avenue is up here. There used to be a underpass uh, subway for the C80 that went under Hill Avenue under a steel bridge. That's been all infill. This is looking east. Um, there's no remnants of the bridge that still exists, but you still get a really good sense of where the prairie path all of a sudden veers off to the south, um, where the original underpass for this uh, bridge went. And just a, several hundred feet to the west of that, you'll see this huge pier sitting off to the south side of the Illinois Prairie Path. And what this is part of, and if you look on the other side, you'll see more piers lining up the cut, the cut of the railway. And what this was for was for the pedestrian bridge, the steel footbridge, pedestrian bridge that went over the CA and E. You've seen it in some of these old photographs. But that's still a, a remnant of that old bridge that still exists. And then very innocuously in downtown Wheaton, um, just to the west of Triangle Park uh, in Wheaton, you'll see this little uh, culvert, about a 10 foot span that uh, was part of the original CA and E bill. So, and again, that's another little bridge that people go over all the time and pay no attention to, but it was part of the original infrastructure of the CA and E. In terms of signal bases and concrete bases and so on, there are still some excellent examples of signal bases along the main, the main line. This one is probably the, the, the one furthest east that we found. This is at 13th Avenue in Maywood, right next to a large uh, electric uh, structure. This one is just over Illinois Route 83 in Villa Park on the south side of the Illinois Prairie Path at Monterey, I believe. There's another one in Villa Park, uh, probably a light base, uh, uh, several blocks to the west of there. And then we see multiple, uh, whole uh, concentration of artifacts in Lombard by Brewster Avenue and Lombard Avenue by the intersection. So if you go in the bushes back in there, uh, you'll find many of these uh, concrete bases that probably serve different purposes, whether they were lighting signal bases or, or, or for crossing signals. Um, this is an example of one that's in Glen Ellen on the north side of the tracks uh, that uh, is that curve that goes through Glen Ellen uh, by the glacial ridge, not too far from the glacial ridge. You find this very fine example of a signal base. And then when you get into downtown Wheaton, again, people pass by these all the time. There's a cluster of three of these uh, concrete bases, signal bases or lighting bases. Um, this is between President and uh, President Chase Street. So there's three back in the bushes. And if you look carefully, you will see them right along the, the path there. In terms of trackage, we know of at least two. And there's probably people in the audience who know a few more, I'm guessing. But uh, this, this one here is the, the siding tracks that were in the Westmore Supply. So this, this is a view looking to the southwest. And this is in Westmore Supply. Um, it's heading back towards the tracks, which run right along here. And it would have carried uh, supplies into Westmore Supply, of course, right at Westmore Road in Lombard. Another one that technically is probably part of the Aurora line, to be fair, is uh, this particular siding. You still see the siding tracks in the gravel for the wall fill building, which is at the, the northwest corner of uh, uh, Carlson, Carlton and Child Street. So the northwest corner of Carlton and Child Street. Um, you'll see this set of tracks that goes into 
this building here, which also probably was a freight building for the CID back in the day. Because remember, this is an aerial photograph of the southwest corner of Wheaton circa 1955. That was a completely different place than it is today. Today, there's a lot of apartment buildings and so on. But 1955 and earlier, the entire southwest quarter of Wheaton was a rail yard with a huge maintenance shed. You have the dispatch tower right on or the south side of the Liberty today. There's the Elgin line coming swooping down into what would be the apartment complex today. Here's the Aurora line cutting right through the what would be the Aurora, the apartment complex today. And Carlton was really a set of tracks, uh, that more so than a road back then. And there's that building I talked about uh, that, that curves, <clears throat> the building curves to align with the, the siding that goes off in this direction. And you can see all the other sidings that go off to the west. And there's the wall fill building right there. And tracks would come up and be able to go right in front of the, the wall fill building. So you can see how this, this landscape has changed thoroughly in the last 70 years. But there's still a few clues left uh, on the ground. Um, so Carlton uh, was a set of railway tracks back uh, in that time frame. You can still see the Elgin line coming down. It would have swooped down into what is the, it didn't make that severe turn like it does today. It would have swooped down, come into the apartment complex, and then come up behind the dispatch tower, which is right there, and then it would have merged into the traffic. And one giveaway on the, this map too, it's very subtle, but you see Liberty comes along and all of a sudden makes a jog north and it comes over this way. That's because there used to be a bridge right there. This little jog, there used to be a bridge where the, the automobiles would go under and the CAE would go over that bridge. So that bridge was at like an angle here and Liberty used to come along and go up at this angle and then come across. And you still see that little jog in the road to this day as a result of the, the CAE. There's the administrative building there's the dispatch tower, and this is where the maintenance shed used to exist. So again, a dramatic change, but there are still a few subtle clues in the ground regarding the original railway. Another major topographical trace, much further to the east in Bellwood. So here's Butterfield Road in Bellwood. Here's Mannheim Road. Here's the Illinois Prairie Path coming in and terminate, basically ending at Mannheim Road. And this is where you take your life near your hands crossing Mannheim Road. <laughs> if, you've ever, if you've ever tried to get across there, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, w when you're on bicycles try or walking, trying to get across Mannheim Road is, is uh, pretty terrifying. But in any event, uh, so this is where the, the Prairie Path uh, continued. And you can still see even though this land was sold off to light industry by Cook County in the 1960s, you can still see through the old uh, parking areas and so on, honoring the old right of way that came right through there. So, you know, again, on the, the aerial met, uh, photographs, you can see where the old line used to go. And then a final one I'll, I'll talk about briefly here is just where the, uh, the Prairie Path used to terminate in Forest Park. But this is First Avenue in Maywood. And this was where the, the old terminal was for the uh, CAD. And this is uh, right here is where the Prairie Path comes along and, and ends at the trailhead. There's a trailhead right there in Maywood. And what the, the, the railway used to do is go southwest, right along here to Harrison, and then come back up and then loop around right in the parking lot of, of what is today the Metro parking lot. But you can still see that, again, you've got old, these modern roads and parking areas that still honor to some degree the original right of way that used to cut through 
what is today a very built up area. So it's just kind of intriguing. Um, and I think this, this area might be interesting to explore for other artifacts right along in there. And of course, the biggest topographical trace is the Illinois Prairie Path and the Fox River Trail. I mean, this almost directly mirrors that 1911 map we kept putting up over and over again. You've got the main line coming right through here, the Elgin line, the Aurora line, the Batavia Spur, the Geneva Spur, and then you've got the Fox Valley trolley system off here. This is the Great Western Trail, by the way, if people are wondering. But the Illinois Prairie Path is, is when people look at the map of the Illinois Prairie Path, it is the original map of the CA and E, almost to, to a T. So, we're wrapping up. <laughs> um, how do you explore it yourself? Uh, there's lots to still see out there if you're interested in doing this. And we, as I mentioned earlier, Joyce and I have done a lot of exploring, but there's other people that have done a lot of, a lot of exploring as well, and there's still a lot to discover. The best time to look is late autumn and early spring when all the foliage has died back. And you want to look on both sides of the trail for 30 feet or more. And we say that because the prairie path that you see today isn't necessarily where the tracks went. Um, in many places in the tracks, they've diverted it to the, to, to the south or the north, for instance, for a variety of reasons, but it's been diverted. So always be aware that if, if the, the, the track is not running straight and true, straight and true, it's probably because they've diverted. I think that's telling us to, no. to shut up. Um, <laughs> But it's probably because they've, they've modified the trackway to, to some degree. So if it's going straight and true, that's what the rail, railway engineers would have built. If it's curving suddenly to the left or the right, that means that's not part of the original path. Look to the utility poles. If you see the utility poles going straight that way, you know that that's where the original right of way went. Um, artifacts tend to cluster near crossings. So that's the other clue to look for. Or you'll see signal bases around curves or uh, where the elevation changes significantly. And that's because you needed signal bases to tell the motor minute conductor if the approaching section was uh, you know, to proceed or not to proceed or to stop. And the other little clue is we tended to, uh, with our smartphone, we, we set our smartphone to record GPS uh, on any photograph that we take. I uh, suspect many of your phones work the same way. So just turn that on so that whenever you take a picture of an artifact, you always get a good GPS location of where that. So when you go back to find it, you could find it. Many times we, we have had difficulty refinding something if we didn't record the GPS coordinates for it. So uh, that's just something, uh, a good practice to, to do. For more information, there's tons of uh, websites that you can get uh, look at Facebook groups. There's the uh, uh, the trolleydodger.com. Uh, David Sadowski, who runs that, uh, is here. So that's an excellent website to look at. Uh, multiple good books, The Great Dirt Rail, The Story of the Chicago Aurora and Elgin Railroad, First and Fastest Periodicals, uh, our YouTube videos, and places. The DuPage County History Museum has a new exhibit on the CIAD. It's well worth seeing. Go see that. Um, the Clintonville Station, uh, go in South Elgin it's on any Sunday. They'll be happy to give you a tour. The Illinois Railway M Museum in Union, Illinois, and the Fox River Trolley Museum in South Elgin. Both great places to visit uh, if you want to know more about uh, the former CIAD. Oh, were people taking a picture of that? I'll go back. Sorry. We need some of the question and answers. Yeah. Right, <laughs> so now this is the part where we'll do Q and A. If there are any questions or comments, um, great thoughts. Oh, sorry. Yes, there is. Hey, the uh, the Batavia Powerhouse was abandoned some point before passenger service was abandoned because I have a picture taken. Someone went into the abandoned powerhouse in 1954, went up to the second floor, and took pictures. Mm -hmm. So, when was it abandoned? Uh, we don't know offhand, but uh, we, I think it was torn down in the 1960s, as I recall. 
uh, but I don't know when it was officially abandoned. I think part of the problem with the the, the powerhouse, just for the for other folks, is that uh, the original powerhouse was designed to, to generate 25 hertz of uh, 26,000 volts of alternating current. That's much slower than modern standards of 60 hertz, so you'd see lights flickering and so on. So. Um, Part of the problem with the old powerhouse was it would have been very expensive to upgrade it and update it. And so it tended to fall out of disuse uh, as, as a result of that by the 1940s, 1950 time frame. But yeah, you had this magnificent, it was actually a very nice, well-built building made of stone and brick um, sitting there along the Fox River that uh, looked in a complete state of disrepair from some of the photographs I've seen from the early 60s and so on. Um, but I, I believe it was torn down in the 60s. So we don't know offhand, but if we find out, we'll we'll let you know if we can find any information about when it was officially shut down or abandoned by Kendall Edison. Um, but I think, no, I take that back. I think uh, the CIAD continued to own it, right? The CIAD continued to own it, not Commonwealth Edison, uh, into the 40s and 50s. Yeah. So that's an excellent question. Does anybody in the audience know? No. Other questions, comments, great thoughts? Yes, this gentleman. Was the, uh, was the entire line electric powered? And if so, how was the electricity delivered? Okay, that's a whole topic uh, unto, unto itself. Um, Yes, it was all electric powered. There were some uh, uh, diesel engines that ran on like freight uh, occasionally and so on, or maintenance uh, locomotives. But all of the passenger and most of the most of the freight was done by electricity. It was 600 volts direct current. Um, it was delivered by those substations we talked about: Clintonville, Prince Crossing, Warrenville, Maywood, um, Hanks Avenue, and Aurora. And uh, it was delivered either via trolley wires, overhead trolley wires in the urban areas and the third rail everywhere else. And that was one of the distinguishing features of the CAE was, and that's why it was called the Great Third Rail, was because when they were built, when it was built in 1902, it was a huge experiment to use a third rail to power such a, a large uh, railway. It had been done, used, third rails have been used for much smaller railways prior to that but never for something that was 50 to 60 miles in length. So a lot of the industry was watching what happened here in uh, the Midwest to see how it worked, and it worked out well. But it was delivered via the third rail that would put that 600 volts uh, onto the third rail or via the overhead uh, trolley wires. Uh, as we mentioned a moment ago, the powerhouse generated 26,000 volts of alternating current, three phase, and the substations converted, uh, they transformed the, the 26,000 volts to 600 volts of AC, and then rotary, rotary converters changed it to direct current. And then it was applied right outside the door, so to speak, of those uh, substations to the rails. Did that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank okay, you. sure. We have a whole series of videos on that, by the way. The Clintonville, watch the Clintonville. Uh, I'm quite proud of that. Yes. Securing land rights is one thing, but was it difficult to get permission to build bridges over roads or rivers or especially competing rail lines? Well, I think, uh, so they, they made all their purchases for the right of way in 1901, and there's, there's still books that, that show the original purchases. For over the competing rail lines, I think the rule is is that the, the one that comes second has to build the, the infrastructure. So when they went over the, the, the Great Western, they had to either go under or over. Uh, but there's nothing that prevented them doing that. I think there was the usual uh, uh, negotiation with the other railroad about doing that. Um, and I'm sure you're aware there was always, uh, they probably traded off uh, with each other. Um, but. I think as long as they didn't do anything stupid, I think they, they allowed them to, to make those, to build those things. As far as roads, um, most of the, the initial ex uh, crossings were, uh, with roads were at grade level. 
the vast majority. And over time, as many of those proved to be unsafe, they would build uh, bridges or underpasses and so on. Uh, but the vast majority, I think, uh, I'd be curious about Hill Avenue, but the vast majority were uh, grade level crossings that got converted. And I think that was done reluctantly because it was done with a lot, cost a lot of money to put in those bridges. Um, but they probably did it because they were getting sued by uh, people who were killed um, or were severely injured at those crossings. Um, and there were, if you study the old newspapers, there were a lot of lawsuits against the CA and E, as well as other railroads, when people were injured or killed. So th that gentleman back there. From Wheaton into Chicago, was it a, a double track the entire way, but the other direction, was it all single? Yes. Um, generally speaking, so the main the main line was all double tracked. There'd be sidings, etc. And the Elgin and Aurora and these two spurs were all single track with occasional with occasional double track. So like the track from downtown Wheaton to Chicago Gulf for some reason was double tracked. Um, they also purchased enough right of way to make it double tracked on all of those lines, but they never they never got to that point where they did that. Um, but but yeah, it was single tracked uh, for most of the most of the branches. This gentleman in Carpentersville, there, there's a factory called Otto, and there used to be existing tracks. But I used to work hmm. the property, and I don't know how it. It would actually, you know, and, and the tracks were gone. We went out there, and I would like little rounds. As I could, we didn't even know what it was, and there were tracks. And now we went up there; it's gone. But uh, that, that does that have a connection to it? Well, it could very well with the the Fox Valley trolley system mm -hmm. that did go down to Carpentersville. Or you said Carpentersville, or you're yeah, Carpentersville, yeah, right. up to Carpentersville. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, it, So it could very well. Um, we're planning to do a series next, uh, probably next summer, on mm -hmm. the Fox Valley Trolley system. So mm -hmm. we don't have a lot of experience with it right now, but we hope to in the coming year. And Otto, the, the factory is old and it's like it's on the substation, to, and it's uh, it's still in existence. They're still used. It, it, buildings. It, and you say it's a substation or it's a. No, no, I'm saying, I don't know, it could have. Oh, but right now it's, it's factory. Oh, I see. And it looks like a lot of stuff. Showing. I see. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's very possible. Mm. We'll be able to answer that question better in about a year. Okay. <laughs> That's the line that went from Carpentersville to Yorkville, right? I think so, yes. That's that's the hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the woman back there? Right behind you. Yes. Um, as a person very interested in our beautiful environment, hearing that we had an electric rail system, it's just like, wow, were the auto industries or the fossil fuel industries opposed to this experiment? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, uh, David could probably speak to this, but but the the electric interurbans of the the night the late uh, 1900s and early two thousand early early 1900s late 1800s those were the dot coms of their day. That was there were. Dozens and dozens of inner urbans built all throughout the United States. It was extremely popular. Electricity was the newfangled technology that everybody was interested in. So electricity was uh, uh, sort of like uh, was the internet in the 1990s. Like uh, AI, we hear a lot about AI today. Did you want to say something, David? Or? Well, uh, there are really two factors involved. Uh, it was. Uh... The main one was the construction of the expressway, I-290, the uh, Congress Eisenhower Expressway, was one factor. But the other factor which kept it from surviving was the fact that it had competition. It had competition uh, at pretty much all the major places that it went to. The CB&Q went to Aurora, Chicago Northwestern went to Wheaton, and uh, Geneva. And uh, the Milwaukee Road went to Elgin, and uh, then, of course, in the city, they were they were running on the tracks of this of the eventually Chicago Transit Authority. So, they it was the uh, other railroads were opposed to uh, aid 
uh, government aid and then of course in uh, those areas in DuPage County and such the residents there didn't want to pay ta uh, increased taxes so that it all conspired to put it out of business Thank you. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, it's the usual suspects. Um, but uh, we, by the way, we had the same reaction when we first started looking into this. We had ridden the Prairie Path for years, and we knew it was a railroad, but we didn't. It's an electric railroad. Wow. I mean, that that was sort of when it caught our attention that uh, we, when it, we sort of became galvanized and started looking into it and studying it, but. Yeah, it's a, it's a shame that this extensive network that went all the way out to Belvedere and went all the way out to DeKalb and went way south beyond Kankakee and went uh, up to through Michigan and so on, this entire network got dismantled over time. So it's, it's pretty amazing. Yes. Did people get killed um, by the third rails? We have a whole series of videos. <laughs> So, come to the next, the, the next talk, we're going to talk about that, but the short answer is yes, but it's not as frequent as people think. Um, you had to be grounded to, in other words, touching with bare skin, you had to touch the third rail, and you had to touch ground at the same time. So, usually when people got electrocuted, it's because they fell, or they were thrown in a car accident. Um, those were the... And if I fell, people are walking along the trackway, they stumble and fall, and they land on the both the third rail and the running rail. Um, people got hit in cars, and they were, th they were thrown, and sometimes they landed on the third rail and the running rail and got killed that way. That was a horrible way to die. Um, but generally speaking, like I said, you had to, you had to be pretty careless to put one foot on both, uh, or, or touch it with one hand, um, and, or be in bare feet, or you had to be sopping wet. That would be another condition. So um, the, the primary way people got killed with the CID was getting hit by the train, either in a car or as a pedestrian. That was the primary way people got killed. So, yes, so. Certainly. Any risk that certain segments of the path uh, where uh, developers can get their hands on segments of the trees? What's the ownership of the path? with such a. So the, the, it's a bit complicated, but when the Illinois Prairie Path came into being, it, uh, the ownership was it was originally owned by the state and they deeded it to the county, so DuPage County, Cook County, and Kane County. Um, and so the counties own the property. Uh, now, Early on, uh, there was some land grabs that occurred in Quick County and Bellwood and so on. I don't know the details of how that, or Joyce doesn't know the details of how that occurred. Um, the, the one by Prince Crossing is a bit of a mystery, uh, how that happened, because that was, I think, the last sale of land of the Illinois Prairie Path that I'm aware of to a private party. So, uh, generally, it's protected by the county owning it. That's the good thing. Um, but yeah, there's been some cases that, how did that happen? Um, we're not entirely sure. But the good news is, is I, I, the last time I calculated it, it's I think roughly 90% of the original right of way is still uh, owned by the, the Prairie Path and the Fox River Trail. So that's pretty good. Um, and one of the areas that got deprecated the most is the Geneva Spur because that was, as Joyce said, that was closed down in 1937. And that wasn't abandoned like the other ones were. So the, the Geneva Spur, they've been able to piece that together fairly successfully. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. So the Illinois Prairie Path, um, we just had a lecture on it about 10 days ago also. And the prairie path is about 66 miles, 67 almost, I think they said it, it jumps back and forth depending on which source you look at. Um, and they are currently working with some um, people in Cook County. Um, the county is working on possibly expanding it. Um, they're also working on trying to figure out a way near the Manheim crossing oh, yeah. to figure out a new path so that it's safer. 
for pedestrians and bikers because um, they specifically mentioned that, yeah, that intersection. Um, so there, there is some growth there still. The association um, used to be more actively involved in caring for it, but in DuPage County specifically, they just worked out um, a way that the the county is actually going to care for it since they own it um, much more than they have in the past. Um, the Prairie Path now is still very active in in advocacy and and everything, but there are some um, actually native prairies along the path that are now going to be taken care of by the county as well. So um, that I just wanted to give that update because we just I just learned that myself about ten days ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's an excellent point, Michelle. And one of the, the extensions I've heard about is they're extending from Maywood the trailhead. They're actively looking at from Maywood the trailhead to Forest Park. It, by the metro terminal, which would be great if they could do that. Um, so, any other final questions or comments? We are doing another talk, as Michelle said, in a few weeks on the accidents and tragedies, and we will be talking about various uh, accounts of, of how people, uh, unfortunately, were got injured or were killed by the CA and E. And we're doing that, we did that largely because of. We asked the same question that you did. How dangerous was the third rail, number one? And number two, we tend to look at these these systems uh, with rose-colored glasses, and we think, oh, what a great thing this was. But there were some bad things about the, the, the railway as well, and um, we just want to make sure that, that we remember that people were seriously injured and killed um, by living too close to the railway, by driving to and from their, their workplace along the railway and so on. It could be a dangerous place. And um, uh, we just want to convey that, that thought. So in any event, I think we're done. Thank you for coming. And I uh, hope you have a great show. Thank you. 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 Thank you.